test one. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Had a good dinner, and if you missed it, you missed some good chicken and dumplings. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 12 tonight. You know, I always enjoy, um, man, you feel like you eat a family dinner, and then you sit down for time with your family in God's Word. Um, I think if more families did this at home, uh, alongside coming to church, the world would be a lot better. Um, Exodus chapter 12 tonight, we're going to start in verse 1. Um, I'm in Genesis chapter 12. That is not where I need to be. Y- y'all are going to get a long Bible study tonight. That looks more like it. So probably, not probably, I'm just going to say it. Um, I know all of God's Word is, is inspired and uh, infallible and errant, but probably, uh, no, I'm going to keep saying probably, the most important chapter in the New Testament. Um, the most important chapter in the New Testament. Um, is what we're going to read tonight, Uh, the most important chapter in the New Testament. And I know, again, it looks like, wow, um, in the Old Testament, let me say that right, the most important chapter in the Old Testament. I knew I was getting weird looks, and uh, then I went back through what I just said and thought, you dummy, you said it wrong. The most important chapter in the Old Testament we are going to study tonight. Um, You know, and I'm going to show you why, but um, to really understand the season that we are in, and what we are going to celebrate Palm Sunday and Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday um, from, from a, a real Old Testament, New Testament perspective, you have to understand Exodus chapter 12. It ties it all together. And so, uh, whoop, Phil's got it. Thank you, Phil. I'll start talking again. He'll get me back up there. Thank you, Phil. Glad you're here. Um, if not, that was going to get unbearably. Y'all were about to see me sprint. Um, so let's go, Lord, in prayer, and we'll take off through this study tonight. Uh, Father, uh, thank you so much just for an opportunity to uh, read your word, study your word. And, and Father, uh, the weight of, of this moment in history, uh, this is a moment that you commanded the Israelites, your people, to celebrate forever, in perpetual forever. Um, and, and still today, even this Sunday, we will, uh, a form of this celebration, we will celebrate at the Lord's Supper. Uh, Father, uh, we will celebrate um, what this chapter introduces to us as, as a truth of the kingdom of God, but also, uh, Lord, about our salvation, about uh, our hope of eternity in heaven. Uh, Father, we're going to see it in a very real illustration tonight that happened in history, uh, that helps us understand uh, really what Jesus came to do. Open our ears, our eyes, our hearts tonight to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, if you haven't been through a Passover Seder, we did one the first year I was here. We're going to do one next year, uh, just so you know. Um, There there are a lot to put on. Uh, It's a lot of preparation of food and all that, but uh, they really changed the perspective of uh, the Old Testament to the New Testament and how they tie together. So you can look forward to that next year. We're going to get that in the works, um, and we're going to do that next spring. But uh, the, the Passover story in Exodus chapter 12, uh, we, we just have to, and I think we just do an injustice uh, in New Testament churches that just preach New Testament passages, right? And, and, and then we take for granted even with young kids, this understanding, well, Jesus came to die and take away your sin. Um, and, and the how and the why and the understanding of that, we, we don't necessarily want to talk about. Um, and one of the reasons we want to talk about it is because blood is yucky, right? And it's dark and blood is bloody. And, and the first thing you do, if you get blood in your hands, you want to go wash it off and alcohol it and sanitize it, right? And yet the Old Testament this picture of, of the blood of a lamb as, uh, you know, our very salvation. And so I want to talk through this tonight. I want to slow down a little bit as we go through it. Um, you know, we've, we just finished with the last plague, and, uh, uh, or the second, we introduced it last week, the plague of the firstborn. And of course, this is going to be different. All the other plagues God, God sheltered his people. He discriminated between, or most of them, between his people, Israel, and the Egyptians. But this plague 
It threatened everyone. And I think it's interesting that we acknowledge that right up front. God did not say, I'm going to come to the firstborn of those in Egypt. He said, I'm going to come to the firstborn, period, all throughout the land. And then he gave instructions. But if you want to live, if you want the angel of death, the destroyer, to pass you by, here are instructions for what to do for Passover so that the angel of death would pass over your home. So uh, the Egyptians and the Israelites, God's people, were all under curse of death here. Um, and, and that's what he says, on the same night, Exodus 12, verse 12, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all of the gods of Egypt. I am Yahweh. Um, this has been a cosmic battle, God declaring himself as Lord, as God, against all the gods of Egypt um, that were worshipped in Egypt. Uh, one Egyptian philosopher I found, now this was interesting, he wrote during the time of Christ, but he said this, there will come a time when it will be seen that in vain have the Egyptians honored the deity with heartfelt piety and service, and all our holy worship will be found bootless and ineffectual. O Egypt, Egypt, of thy religion, nothing will remain but an empty tale, which thine own children in time to come will not even believe. Nothing will be left but graven words, and only the stones will tell of your worship. Um, you know, that was written during the time of Christ, um, but it's true today that all of these gods of Egypt, you don't hear about them anymore. They don't make statues to them anymore in Egypt. Even the Egyptians, they have given up on them altogether. Um, but, uh, you know, all the, though the words were written in the time of Christ. They almost serve as a commentary on the Egyptian culture at that time. But what God did to the Egyptians wasn't a surprise. Um, we expected it. Every plague has gotten worse. We expect it. Um, what is surprising is that he treated his people, Israel, the same way. They were under the sentence of death. And I want to talk a little bit about that because the Israelites would have been shocked to discover, hang on, hang on, it was dark over there, but it was light over here, right? God, you've separated us all, all along the way and taking care of us, but now we're at risk of, of losing our firstborn. Um, what did we do wrong may have been their mentality. Are we not your God's people? Um, so I want to talk about that a little bit um, because I, I think it's, it's so crucial to New Testament understanding that, you know what God's people were? They were sinners, just like the Egyptians. And I think it's important that, that we don't draw a distinction that there are good guys and bad guys in the Bible. There are only one type of people in the Bible, bad guys, <laughs> sinners, right, uh, that deserve judgment. Um, and we see that. I mean, in Exodus chapter 5, uh, Moses says this, May the Lord look upon you and judge you. You have made us a stench, this is the people talking to Pharaoh, to Pharaoh and his officials, and have put your so a sword in their hand to kill us. Um, you know, even after Moses tells them God's word and God's going to come and deliver you, the Israelites were totally rebellious, were totally mean. They didn't like uh, Moses. They, they wanted to throw away or throw him out. Um, even after, in Joshua 24, verse 14, I brought this up last week to somebody afterwards. Joshua 24, 14, uh, Joshua tells the Israelites, throw away the gods your fathers worship beyond the river in Egypt. That's a big statement. That means that they carry some of that gold and silver and all that jewelry that they carried across the Red Sea. You know what else they carried with them? Their gods, some of those Egyptian gods. Throw them away uh, and serve the Lord, Joshua says. So uh, I, I, I want to just make it very clear. The Bible teaches us, Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Um, the first Passover proved by fact that it implicated Israel just as much as it did Egypt. And I think we ought to understand that. Uh, we, they were as guilty as every Egyptian there. Uh, one person, and I read a story this week, this has nothing to do with the Bible study, but man, I thought it illustrated it so great. Um, Major League Baseball player Damian Easley, and I don't know if you know, Damian Easley serves as the hitting coach right now for the Arizona Diamondbacks, who are actually really good uh, the last few years. But uh, years ago, he played for the California Angels, and uh, I read his testimony this week. He was riding in an airplane, 
and he overheard some teammates on the Los Angeles Angels talking about God, and they were sitting a few rows behind him, and one of them said, you know, if this, if this plane were to crash tonight, would we go to heaven? They, they just asked. And he's two rows up listening, and a man easily said, I just got really uncomfortable. So he said, eventually I got up and I walked back and sat right behind these teammates talking about it, and uh, I wanted to get some answers, and he, he couldn't understand what they were talking about. So he asked a question, he, and he started asking, well, so what, what is this deal about heaven, and what is this deal about God, and, 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 and what will happen if the plane went down? And by the time the flight was over, by Easley's words, he had totally given his life to Christ, uh, turned away from his sin, was living a new life. But it all started, he said, with this recognition that if, if I, this plane were to crash right now, if this plane were to crash right now, I am guilty of sin, and I would be punished for that sin. It's important when we approach Scripture, um, and probably one of the most important realizations, you know, somebody never will come to Christ if they don't first recognize that they're sinful, that they're a sinner. And that requires, by the way, preaching about righteousness preaching about what's right and wrong. So I'll have some people come up sometimes and say, you know, pastor, we just don't like it when you preach about specific sins. Okay? And they're all sin, right? And so what, what, I mean, we can talk about this vague general idea, but if people don't know what sin is, and I don't ever come in here and just pick on one specific sin, I, well, you know, sin is sin, right? But uh, it's funny when you ask a kid, do you know what sin is? They will always, they, rather than tell you a definition of sin, like doing what God want, doesn't want you to do, they will always give you an example of sin. You'll say, well, what is, you know, what is sin? And they'll say stealing or lying, right? They will always give you an example. Well, people in the church are just the opposite. Adults don't want you to give any examples. They just want you to give the definition. It makes us a lot more comfortable, Right? But the fact is, from the pulpit, and this is how my policy is on that, if the Bible, the text that I'm preaching that day, is talking about, you know, stealing, I'm going to preach on stealing. If the Bible talks about gluttony, ooh, I'm not liking it very much, but I'm going to preach to myself about eating too much. And if homosexuality is in the text that day, I'm not going to say, oh, I don't want to offend anybody. Um, I'm not going to preach on, I'll just talk about, that's not how, uh, you just don't do that. Because preaching on sin is, is what helps us understand that I'm a sinner. I do that, and God's Word tells me not to do that, and so I need to repent of that, and I need to accept Christ. The problem in the pulpits of America today, many of them, we are so scared to preach on sinfulness. And if you don't have people in the congregation that realize they're a sinner, and then you get to that part where you say, come be saved, they wonder, what do I have to be saved from? Right? So, I always kind of take it in stride when somebody says, hey, you know, you don't have to preach on, uh, you know, specific sins. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, the Bible does that very clearly. And it's so important that we understand what sinfulness is because I'm going to preach, preach that, uh, the gospel that saves us from that sin. Jesus came to die for not your goodness, your sinfulness. And if you're here today or listening online and you think, I don't have any sinfulness, you know, you can polish your halo the rest of the way to hell. And, and, whoa, that was rough, wasn't it? That's, but it's true because no one's going to go sacrifice a lamb for their goodness, right? And that's the picture we're going to see tonight in Scripture. Um, the Israelites had to know, um, and this started very early on. You know, God said, Genesis two seventeen, where I started tonight, right? You must not eat from the tree of knowledge, good and evil, for when you eat of it, what will happen? You're going to die, right? Uh, Romans five twelve. New Testament, Old Testament. Notice how I did that? Uh, the message is the same. Death came to all men because all sinned. sinned. Uh, very easy. Um, I mean, it's just a, it's a truth of Scripture. Um, that's what Damien realized. Um, the angel of death is coming for all of us, and we've earned punishment because we're all sinners, and it doesn't matter the color of your skin or the money in your bank account or how healthy you are, how many muscles you have. We all have the same deadly problem. We're all sinners. Um, and the message of the gospel is good news for us sinners, because in God's mercy, He provided us a way of life. When it says, turn away from sin and sin no more, well, you never turn away from, or you never are away from sin, and you never stop sinning until the day you die. So, what is that? You know, and, and there is, and, and it's a good point. You know, we, 
it's not the it's not the being sinless, right? It's the pursuit of sin. So we are turning away from sin. Uh, we are making an effort to run toward God and away from sin. Uh, but it is not that pursuit that saves us, right? It's not that that changing directions. And some people, you'll often hear online, you'll often hear this debate between, uh, well, what is true conversion, right? What is true conversion? And, and you know, do you, how, and, and everybody's going to disagree or be different on this, but at what level do you have to have life change, right, to go to heaven, to accept Jesus? And, and the greatest example for that is very live. It's about to happen in Easter. Jesus is on a cross between two thieves, right? One's a murderer, suppose, and one's a thief. They're both criminals convicted to die. One blasphemies and says, you're not the son of God. I don't believe you. You know, if you were, you would get down. The other one says, hey, you be quiet, dude. This guy is sinless. He's perfect. He doesn't deserve to be here. Jesus turns to that guy. That moment of faith, Jesus turns to him and says, today, today you're going to be with me in heaven. That guy didn't have a chance to turn away to change, to go give his money to the poor, to do good works. The only thing that he had was what Paul tells us we have to have. He had faith. And that's why I will always preach, it is faith that saves and not works. Don't let somebody come along in your life and ever say, well, because you're not living the way that you should be living, you're not saved anymore. It is not works that saves us. It is faith that saves us. Should that faith produce works in our lives? Yes. I will not argue with that. So if you've been baptized when you were eight years old and you've lived like a heathen ever since, right, you might look back and say, where is my faith? Did I really put my faith in Jesus Christ? It may be that you did and you've ran away from him. It may be that, you know, like a lot of kids at at eight years old, you wanted a cookie and you wanted to go swimming in a bathtub. You thought it looked fun, but you really never understood that you were a sinner, that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. I have students come to me all the time, all the time. Ah, you know, I've been messing around with my girlfriend, been drinking too much, been partying. Uh, I'm doing things that God, I, I think I need to be baptized again. Right? So, the, so well, why? Well, I don't know if I was ever saved. And I'll say this. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Yes. Well, according to Jesus... For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. According to Jesus, Jesus didn't say there, hey Nicodemus, believe in me and do everything that I say. Right? (laughs) None of us would make it. We're done at that point. If our pursuit has to be perfect, we're done at that point. That's why it says we're saved by grace through faith right? It's faith in Jesus that saves us, and that's a gift that God gives us through, through his grace, through his love. Um, but, you know, and, and I didn't want to chase that as far as I did, but I do think it's important because I do hear all the time this idea, well, because you watch this TV show or you, you know, vote this certain way or, you know, you, you let a bad word out at your golf course, yeah, you ought to repent. You ought to run back to Jesus, right? But don't come over and say, hey, pastor, I need to be baptized again. I need to be baptized again. I'm going to ask you the same question I ask everybody else. Do you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Well, that faith is what saves you. If it's anything else, it's not faith. You hear that? If it's anything else, it's works. If you've got to be, put your faith in Jesus and not ever cuss anymore, what saved you? And a clean mouth. Do you see that? But Jesus never taught that. He was very clear, it is faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why understanding Passover was so important. It's so important. Jesus didn't say, God didn't say, sacrifice that lamb and do everything that I've commanded the rest of the year and the angel of death will pass over you. He said, take the lamb, the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorpost and I will pass over you because judgment will be paid on your behalf because God expected Israel to sin again. You know how I know that? They had to do it again and again and again, right? He expected them to. But then he sent Jesus. We're jumping to the end of my Bible study, and I'm not even started yet. And he said, hey, blood and bulls and goats won't work. So the Lamb of God, the spotless Lamb of God, the Son of God, is going to come and die once and for all. 
for the sins of the world. You don't have to sacrifice a lamb every time you sin. I'm really glad there wouldn't be enough lambs in the world, right? But if works are saving us, if works are saving us, you see the problem? How good do you have to be? How good do you have to be? I want to ask some people that. And they come and say, oh, man, I don't know. That I just, you know you've got to have this life of works and life of goodness. Well, how good? Like, monk in a monastery, never turn on a TV, listen to radio, pray and read the Bible all the time kind of good? Or the not watch TV, not have a cell phone kind of good? Or the not let something slip on the golf course? Oh, you, you think you got to control your mouth? What about what you think? Right? Wasn't that Jesus's point? Like, you think you're good. You think your works really matter. What about your heart? And then we find out, you know what? I am a wretched sinner. Even your pastor's one. And that's why it can be works. If it's works, I'm in trouble. If it's works, we better fill up the baptistry and somebody better get up there and dunk me. When I come up, they better again. And tomorrow again. And we're going to do that over and over and over again because works will never be enough. Or, or we can trust a better way, the biblical way. We can put our faith not in our own works, but in the works of Jesus, in the holiness of Christ, in the blood of Christ. And, and after approaching the cross and seeing what he does for us, seeing him die for us, we ought to turn from that sin, right? Right? The motivation for turning ought to not be our, our skin, our salvation. It ought to be our love for him and our compassion for him. Uh, there's such a difference between the two things. Uh, you'll never get somebody to run toward God in fear as hard as you will in love. When somebody realizes that God, he gave his son for me. He died on the cross for me. I wanna, that's my motivation for ministry, by the way. I don't preach to y'all every week and read the Bible and pray trying to get into heaven. That's a miserable way to live. It's a miserable way to live. I have my place in heaven secure, and I serve God from that love. He loved me. He loved me when I didn't deserve it. He forgave me when I didn't deserve it. My motivation for forgiving somebody, it's not, oh, man, if I don't forgive them, I'm, I'm going to go to hell. No, my motivation for forgiving somebody is, look what I've been forgiven. I just want to be like Jesus, and I want to please him because he died for me. Man, it changes everything about our faith. Don't let everybody, anybody ever convince you that, that works our way. The, the Passover, it, it flies right in the face of all of that. Because, again, they didn't have to sacrifice a lamb and be good and obey the law. They had to sacrifice a lamb because they hadn't obeyed the law. They were sinners, right? Um, man, just watch. Let's just watch. Exodus chapter 12. I better get into this. We won't finish. Um, this month is to be for you the first month. Guess what? Change the whole calendar based on Passover. This is the first month uh, of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb from his family, one from each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor. Having taken into account the number of people there are, you determine the amount of the lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year old males without defect. And you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Now, each house was to choose its own lamb, a yearling. It had to be perfect. It was destined to serve as a sacrifice for sin. The only sacrifice acceptable to God is a perfect sacrifice. So the, the lamb had to be pure. It had to be spotless, whole, and sound. Leviticus 22.20 God says this to Moses, do not bring anything with a defect. It will not be accepted. When anyone brings the herd of their flock, it must be without defect or blemish to be acceptable. Do not offer to Yahweh the blind, the injured, the maimed, or anything with warts or festering or running sores. Because God is holy, and the only sacrifice that pleases him is a holy sacrifice. It has to be the best we have to offer. And then God proceeded to explain what to do with the lamb. Chapter 12, verse 7. Take some of the blood... Kill the lamb, take some of the blood, put it on the sides and the tops of the door flames of the houses where you eat the lambs. The same night they're to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with the bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roast it over the fire. Head, legs, and inner parts. Do not leave any of it until morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you're to eat it. With the cloak tucked in your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So 
This meal was intended to serve as a yearly reminder of the Israelites, what they suffered in Egypt. The bitter herbs would remind them of their bitter work, uh, the the tears, the salt water. I'm not going to go through all that tonight. The unleavened bread reminded them how they're supposed to flee from sin, get sent out of their lives, out of their houses. Uh, That staff reminded them that they have to be ready to leave Egypt in a moment's notice. Um, Once the lamb was roasted, it had to be ate entirely. The Bible does not explain why, but it was too sacred what they didn't want, and this is my argument against leftovers. Um, God does not like leftovers either, so uh, just remember that. Uh, we put leftovers in our fridge all the time. We throw them out a week later, but uh, that's what that's for. Uh, you know, he, you have to eat it all. It was too holy, basically, as God's saying, to do anything else with it. You don't get to make a sandwich with this lamb meat the next day or lamb nachos. This is special. It's a special meal. That's God's point here. Um, all the details are important, but the most important thing, and I, I'm going to skip over a lot of the details of the Passover meal. We just don't have time for that. That's why we're going to do a Seder next year. I, I want to focus on the killing of the lamb, because when God saw the lamb's white wool on the doorpost, death would pass over. No? The blood. We would all agree But the most important part of this whole act was the blood on the doorposts of the house, right? I'm going to show you why that matters so much. The blood on the doorposts, God would see and death would pass over. Uh, What God required for salvation was the offering of the lamb. This is what he has always required. Go back to the time of Adam and Eve. You can make a pretty firm argument. That Cain brought the first fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, but Abel brought the fat portions, right, uh, of the firstborn of his flock. Um, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. It was brought in faith, but on Cain his offering, he did not look on it with favor. That's Genesis 4. Abel brought the lamb. Uh, God required a lamb. In salvation, I love this, in salvation, God always gives what God demands. Did you hear that? I want to show you that in Scripture. In salvation, God provides what He demands. It means everything you need to be saved, God will provide it. You hear that? And to bring your own works, your own money, God will provide it. We see that over and over the, again in Scripture. In salvation, God gives what God demands. So, Again, let's just continue the history of redemption. I want you to see this all throughout. We've been here just recently, but uh, and if you haven't seen the movie uh, Only Son, I believe it's Only Son. You need to Google search it. It's on YouTube, I believe. Um, It may or it's on Netflix. I mean, I think you can rent it on um, Apple TV. It's God's Only Son, I believe. It It is so or Only Son. It is so good. It's a story of Abraham offering his son Isaac. I'm not saying it's perfectly biblical, but it is really, really close, and it is really, really good. Um, And I thought, how in the world are they going to show a movie about a a dad offering his son as a sacrifice, right? I was so scared of it, but they did it so well. Um, But this is the cool thing about that story, man. They get up there. I don't know how that looked. I don't know why Isaac went um, so willingly, right? Stacks him on the, the wood, puts Isaac and ties him to the, the fire, about to raises the knife. Do you remember that story? And about the time that he draws the knife down to kill his son, God stops him, the angel stops him, says, Don't do it. And then Abraham looks over in a thicket right next to him. What was there? A lamb. Isn't that cool? And God said, no, I'm Jehovah Jireh, which is the first time that word is used in the Old Testament. I am the provider, and I will provide the lamb. I will provide the lamb. We should have been paying attention way back in Genesis, and we would have not needed anything else to know that God will provide the lamb. God's going to provide the lamb. We learned that in the story of Abraham. The fire and the wood are here, Abraham asked, or Isaac asked, but Father... Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Isaac knew what God required. Isaac understood. Where's the lamb? Abraham knew it too because the verse after that, Abraham looks at his son and says, Isaac, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. 
You know what's cool about that? Abraham, from the very beginning, believed that God was going to provide a lamb. Not his son. Abraham had faith that there was going to be a lamb on that hillside, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, People say all the time, well, did Abraham fully go thinking he was going to sacrifice his son? No. Abraham went believing God would provide a lamb because God provides what he demands. And even in the story of Abraham, that's what God did. Abraham looked up there in the thicket. He saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it at a burnt offering. And Isaac went, uh, instead of his son, because God provided what God required, a lamb to die in the place of Abraham's firstborn son. Isn't that cool? All the way back in Genesis, um, every year God provided a lamb for the sacrifice of Israel on the Day of Atonement. The high priest would bring an animal into God's presence and would sacrifice it as a sin offering. These were the instructions, Leviticus 16. He shall then slaughter the goat of the lamb for the sin offering for the people, take its blood, its blood behind the curtain, sprinkle it on the atonement cover of the Ark of the Covenant, and in front of it, in this way he'll make atonement. Atonement, we'll talk about that word. Because of the uncleanliness and rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins have been. Do you have rebellion and sin? You need atonement. Atonement. You know what the atonement is? The blood of a lamb. We're taught that all through. You can take the Leviticus numbers, Deuteronomy, you can sum them all up in this temple and all these sacrifices with that one statement. We have rebelliousness, uncleanliness, whatever your sins have been, You need atonement, payment for that sinfulness. That's what the Old Testament was there to teach us. Um, Now, there's an obvious progression here even in the Old Testament because each time the lamb is introduced, it serves as a representation or representative for a larger and larger group of people. At first, God provided the lamb maybe for one person in place of Isaac. Next, God provided in the book of Exodus a lamb for one household right? Later on, for the nation of Israel, once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the Lamb was for the entire nation of Israel. This is where it gets so cool. And I I thought about waiting to the very end, but you know where I'm going. That's what's so amazing about John chapter 1, verse 29, the pivotal point where the Old Testament and the New Testament come together. And where every Jew, every Gentile, every, every person in this room ought to go, aha! Because up to this point, no one understood. But John the Baptist did. When he's sitting on the bank of the Jordan River, and he sees Jesus coming up, who hadn't even really started his ministry, hadn't been baptized, and he said, behold, the Son of God. Is that what he said? Don't miss that. Because if he had said cat of God or dog of God or I don't know, put whatever animal you want in there, it wouldn't have made any sense. John the Baptist wasn't just picking animals that day. Jesus, the Lamb of God. Because in our American culture, that's not something we would necessarily understand. Because you've never taken a lamb before dinner and slit its throat. A lamb that your kids played with all week. A spotless and perfect lamb. You've never done that. You've never gone to the temple and seen a lamb that bore your sin and, and slaughtered by the priest. You've never experienced that. So in America, most Christians, especially that don't read the Old Testament, when they come to John 1, we don't have a clue what's going on there except some religious, churchy language. Our pastor says the Lamb of God all the time, right? We use those words. No, this is more than church language. This is our salvation and how it happened. Behold, the Lamb of God, John the Baptist knew from the very beginning. We don't need a Passover lamb anymore. We don't need a sacrificial system anymore because this is the Son of God, the Lamb of God, the once and for all sacrifice who takes away the sin of not the, you know, 
we're still arguing in the New Testament time after the crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. You know, James and Peter and Paul, they're still arguing whether the Gentiles or the Jews deserve salvation, right? John the Baptist understood. He understood. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He knew. He included us in that. Isn't that good news? He saw and said, no, the, the world's sin is going to be taken away by this Lamb of God. He will make atonement. Man, uh, and then, I mean, just, but just think about it. I mean, the Lamb of God slain from the creation of the world. Revelation 13, 8 says this. The consistent message of the Bible is that anyone who wants to meet God must come on the basis of their good works. <laughs> I'm trying to catch you up tonight. <laughs> Anybody that wants to come to God must come on the basis of the blood of the Lamb. That's how we approach God. Read the entire book of Hebrews. The entire book is an argument for what I'm talking about tonight. We do not need to sacrifice bulls and goats anymore. Good works will not get you there. The blood of the Lamb is the only way. Christ and his redemption are the subject of the entire Word of God, not just the New Testament. And nothing's more clear than at the first Passover, like everything else in Exodus. Uh, you know, think about it. Don't miss the connection. That lamb had to be perfect, had to be spotless, right? 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says this, Christ, if you think I'm making a connection like, ah, that John the Baptist, he was churchy. Maybe he said something off key. Uh, or the pastor, he's drawing these. I had somebody say that. It takes a lot of uh, uh, mumbo jumbo is how they worded it in order to bring the, the Passover lamb and connect it to Jesus. Really? That's what Paul said. Do you believe him? Our Passover lamb, that, and, and you, you know what? We can turn there. I will real quick. Uh, I didn't realize I had just part of it up there. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Because he says a little bit more than that. 5, 7. Yeah, I missed the most important part. <laughs> Fired. <laughs> I have decided, 5, 7. Um, your, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven, a little sin, ruins a whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so there may be a new lump. We're talking about Passover, right? This is in the New Testament, by the way. Clean out the old leaven so there may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, why are you unsinful? You don't want to, want to know why you don't have leaven in your life? Now, you may sin, but you're not sinful anymore. Your sinfulness has been taken away if you're a believer, forgiven. How? Your new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ... This is what I missed. For Christ, our Passover has been sacrificed. For Christ. Who's our Passover lamb today? For those some people who say, well, you just, you're just really kind of pulling things together to, to make Jesus the Passover lamb. No. Paul did it so clearly. You know who else did it that's more important? <laughs> Jesus. In Matthew 26. We're going to celebrate this moment this week. You're going to hear these two verses read in Spanish and in English, which is cool. Jesus picked up the cup at Passover and, and picked up that bread. And what did he do with that bread? He broke it and he said, this bread is my body. I am the Passover sacrifice. This blood, this blood that saves you, this blood, it's my blood. This cup, it's my blood. And the disciples went, what in the world? Because they didn't get what John the Baptist was saying yet. They didn't understand. What do you mean? And Jesus, you know, he said some hard things like, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood in order to get to heaven. Woo. Why? See, that's why we freak out about verses like that, because we don't realize Jesus is talking about the Passover lamb. What'd you have to do? You had to eat every drop of that lamb, roast it over the fire. Whatever's left, you had to burn. You couldn't. It was holy. Jesus said, you want to go to heaven now? It's not through that. I'm the Passover lamb. And it's my blood that saves you. I mean, the, the message of, of the Bible of salvation is it's the same from front to back. Uh, this is my body. This is my blood. And then he was crucified late in the afternoon on the evening of Passover. 
Isn't that cool? Twilight, lambs would be sacrificed by every household according to the law of Moses. All over the city, the fathers were making offerings, gathering their families together and saying, hey, guys, this is the lamb that God has provided for us. And over at the temple, at the same time that these households were sacrificing these lambs and, and about to eat dinner, the high priest was preparing a lamb to present as the atonement for all of Israel's sin. And at that exact same moment, some scholars believe the moment that the lamb died, Jesus was ha- there hanging on the cross with his blood running down from his hands and from his side, the Lamb of God taking away the sins of the world. When God tells a story in history of our salvation, man, he started in the book of Genesis telling us his story. And yet so many miss it. And it is, it's, it's, it's uncomfortable, it's it's yucky. Uh, you know, Stephen Spielberg, any of y'all seen the movie The Prince of Egypt? Cartoon, old. It's, 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 really, it's really good. It's well done. Um, it was a cartoon about the story of Moses. And uh, it was well done. Again, not perfect biblically, but it was good. The music was phenomenal in it. Um, but interesting, Stephen Spielberg, uh, when he, he produced the film, and the original script for the, because it's a children's movie, um, it had God saying, when I see the mark on the doorframe, when I see the mark on the doorframe, and literally, all the religious leaders, he had hired a whole bunch from Christians to Jews, you name it, all the religious leaders that he had hired to consult with in the film studio all threw a fit and said, if you write that, we, we're quitting, we're done. We're not helping anymore. Because it wasn't a mark on the doorpost. It was the blood on the doorpost. And if you go watch that movie today, literally, in a kid's movie, it says the blood on the doorpost. And I remember watching that with my kids and like, ew. I mean, this is blood. That's bloody. But it's necessary to mention the blood of Jesus because the Passover regulations explicitly required a blood sacrifice. There's blood spilling all over the book of Exodus chapter 12. Uh, the Israelites were commanded to slaughter their lambs, and there wasn't any way to do that without shedding blood. And once the lamb was sacrificed, they were to take that blood, and they were to paint it, paint it. You can see in the picture on the door frames of that house. And, and, and God said, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass over. God said in verse 13, the blood will be a sign for you, and when I see the blood. So when you see the blood, you can remember I'm saved. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Two very important religious words there, and I don't care that you have to learn them, but in theological circles, we talk about the expiation, expiation of sin. It's kind of a, an interesting word. It means that, 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 that sin covered, or that blood covered our sin. That's what expiation means. It means we look at the blood and we see my sin is covered. But then there's this other word, theological word, the propitiation of our sin. And the propitiation, mean, propitiation means that God sees the blood and, and he passes by. He sees that the penalty has been paid. So we have a reminder at communion or even in scripture that, you know what, my sin has been covered by the blood of Jesus. And when God sees that blood applied to our lives in faith, he passes over us in judgment. It's the same story. Um, even though we may not know the definition of those big words, right? We see them in our lives. Uh, Over the century, uh, this sacrifice was repeated millions of times. You know, King Josiah, when he celebrated the Passover, uh, I guess he probably made a lot of mistakes. Uh, Josephus records that he slaughtered 37,000 sheep. That's in second, not Josephus, that's in second Chronicles 3.5. 37,000 sheep. Because he was a king and he thought, I've got a lot of problems. I want to make sure. Uh, you can imagine 37,000 sheep being slaughtered, all that blood going everywhere. According to Josephus, ancient historian, um, several hundred thousand lambs were herded through the streets of Jerusalem every Passover. It's appropriate time to talk about that. You know what's starting this week or has started? Go down to the stock show, support our kids. They're working their tails off, but you won't see 100,000 animals, and none of them killed, by the way, yet. <laughs> I can't imagine hundreds of thousands herded to the streets of Jerusalem 
every Passover. That means quite possibly the day that Jesus was coming, Palm Sunday, into Jerusalem. You know what else was coming in in droves? Lambs. Hundreds and thousands of lambs. White, perfect, spotless lambs as Jesus rode in on a donkey. Yet not even the blood of all those animals could atone for sin. Uh, Hebrews makes that very clear. Hebrews 10.4 tells us it's impossible for, for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. It's just a covering, a temporary covering. What was needed was perfect blood. You know, I, I like uh, Charles Spurgeon. You know, sometimes when it was said long ago, it was just said so much better than we say it now. Charles Spurgeon, uh, he was responding to the attitude. Uh, somebody told him, we don't, we don't need to talk about blood at church. It's just something you don't talk about at church. This is what he said. We do not subscribe to the lax theology which teaches that the Lord Jesus did something or other which in some way or the other is in some degree or other connected with the salvation of men. We firmly believe the doctrine of the atoning death of our great substitute. We can stand to the literal substitution of Jesus Christ in the place of his people and his real endurance of suffering and death in their steed And from this distinct and definite ground, we will not move an inch. Even the term, the blood, from which some shrink with the affection of great delicacy, we shall not cease to use. Whoever may take offense at it, for it brings out that fundamental truth, which is the power of God unto salvation. We dwell beneath the blood mark, and we rejoice that Jesus for us poured out his soul unto death. And he was a scholar. Man, and wrote so well. We believe in the doctrine of the substitutionary atonement. Jesus shed his own blood for our sins. Is that what the New Testament teaches? Absolutely. Let me show you. You knew I was going to anyway. (laughs) Romans 5, verse 9. We have now been justified by what? Paul, y'all not talk about blood like that. It's yucky, right? Unless it's really what saves you. Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood. How? For the forgiveness of sins. We're saved. We're forgiven through his blood. Hebrews 13, 12. Jesus suffered to make the people holy, how? Through his blood. Through his blood. You were redeemed, 1 Peter 1.18 says. What were we redeemed with? What were you bought with? What did Jesus pay for your soul with? The precious blood of Christ. A what? You can't miss it now. Right? <laughs> Changes the way you read the whole Bible. A lamb. What kind of lamb? A perfect one. Why? Oh, I remember that Passover story now. It makes sense. Hmm. 1 John 1, 7. The blood of Jesus, what's it do? Purifies us from all sin. The reason for all this talk is about blood is very simple. Hebrews 9, 22 says it. Leviticus 17, 11 says it. There's one in the new and one in the old. Without the shedding of blood... There is no forgiveness of sin. Had Jesus not died on the cross, we wouldn't be going to heaven. We would have no way to heaven. We would be doomed because of our sin. Uh, When we look at the cross, we see the payment that has been made for our sin. And when God looks down at the cross, he sees that it's stained with the blood of his own firstborn son. God does not have a substitute to offer in the place of his son. His son is and was and always will be the substitute. And when God saw and sees the blood of his son, he says, it is enough. My justice is satisfied. The price for sin is fully paid. Death will pass over you and you will be safe forever. And this is why I do not subscribe to any form, shape, or fit of any kind of work salvation because you can add nothing to the saving power of the blood of Jesus Christ.
can do it. This is also why I'm a once saved, always saved, Bible believing pastor. Because what in the world could undo the powerful, saving blood of the Lamb? Well, well, hang on, Pastor. Sin? A lot of sin? Why was the Lamb sacrificed? For the forgiveness of. So you're saying to me that sin can cover the blood. That's not what I see in the Bible. I see the blood covering the sin. Never backwards, Catherine. demands what he has provided. Sometimes we ask ourselves, what was in the head of Adam when he just did what he did? And the whole thing is coming to the aspect of just obedience, follow instructions, question not, follow instructions. Because it is coming out that in the Passover, it was just about the lamb, not a bull, not a good oxen or ox in the, in the field or whatever they had follow instructions and that passes over you. And when it comes to the love of, uh, of God, Jesus Christ, it's, it's just obedience to him, accepting him is the only way, no negotiations. And it is, I, I don't know what is going on in my head. This is just like, so It's good. And, and Catherine, I'll help answer that some. So, so, you know, there were some very strict, you think about it, you know, we say, well, it's faith that saves, right? It's faith that saves. And this is really, it's where I was going tonight to end with. Guess what you had to have? <laughs> you had a choice. God says, okay, the angel of death's coming. All the firstborn are going to die. But if you sprinkle, kill this lamb, and you, you sprinkle this blood on the doorpost, you do what I ask this way, I'll pass over you. You want every person had that did that? Faith. Faith. It's always been faith that saves. There's no distinction in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Faith was in the coming lamb then, in the lamb that has been slain today. That's why it's so important. Jesus said, that, or God said that the, Jesus was actually slain before the foundation of the world. Because the second God's mind decided, uh, you know what? I'm going to do this. It had happened. So they were putting their faith in the coming lamb by being obedient to God, by sacrificing this lamb. That's why he said Abraham believed, right? He believed, he had faith, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Because Abraham was saved by the same faith you're saved in. It's in the coming lamb. And, you know, when we, when we recognize it, well, how, how do we know that? Well, John the Baptist knew it before Jesus even came on the scene. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so it was always faith. It was never, so don't, don't confuse the sacrifice of the Lamb, and I've read about some people wanting to do this, with the obedience of the law. There was no law. Was no law. We don't even have the, the, the law yet. It's a good point, Benny. Don't, don't confuse the two. It was ridiculous. Kill the spotless lamb, put blood on your doorposts, and your firstborn won't die. I mean, you know the story, so you believe it. But if I told you to go home tonight, sacrifice your cat, not your dog, because God loves dogs. <laughs> Rub the blood on your doorpost. And the angel of death will pass over your house tonight. Or better than that, the hell storm that's coming. None of you would go kill your cat. Not if I said it. Very good. Because you don't have faith in what I'm telling you. And you know what? We all have that decision to make when it comes to the word of God. And he gives us a choice. Here's my word. Here's the way I want to save the world. Here's my, my lamb, my spotless lamb. And 
Hebrews 11.28. Just finish there. Hebrews 11.28. I'm going to turn there. You can too if you want. I think I have it on the screen. I do have it on the screen. Cheater. <laughs> Hebrews 11.28. That's why you do Bible drills so you can find books fast. Look, I even have my little marker there. Back in the day, yeah, we don't do Bible drill anymore. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's worse. Kids can just Google search. The Bible shows up. What was it? This is great. Catherine, your, your, your answer right there. Hebrews eleven twenty eight. What was it that caused him to keep Passover? By faith. Moses kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that the destroyer, that is not spelt right, <laughs> destroyer, Get that off the screen, Jarrett, please. There, who's there right up there? So that the destroyer of the first, thank you. <laughs> By faith. I love that. I mean, and you know what's funny is I haven't been back to my notes hardly this whole thing. You guys have just tracked with me through this whole Bible study, and, and I love that, and got to where I was going before I did because, you know, you just beg the question, well, what about us? What about what saves us? Faith. In the blood of the Lamb, the pure and spotless and holy and perfect blood of the Lamb. Uh, And that's what we're going to celebrate. Palm Sunday, going to preach on the cross this week. Going to preach on some face-to-face encounters at the resurrection on Easter Sunday. We're going to be right here. I'm not going to preach on Passover. um, But isn't it cool on our Wednesday nights, and I brought this up if you're visiting with us or listening online. You know, I started Genesis 1-1 like two years ago, and I planned to be right here. (laughs) Two weeks before Easter. I'm just not that good. (laughs) But God is, and he knew. When I told my wife, she asked me last night, what are you teaching tomorrow night? And I said, Passover. And she said, isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? Because she knows how I plan. (laughs) It's how a guy with three kids, right, and wife and busy church plans. Um, But she also knows, and she said, isn't that cool how God did that? Uh, Because we get to go into Passover maybe understanding it a little bit better. And, And right now you can know all around the world Jews are getting ready. You know, isn't that interesting? It's sad. It's sad. They're going to sit down to this Passover feast, and at some point they're going to open the door and let Elijah in, and they're going to say, Come, Messiah, come. Save us, save us, save us. Because they never really understood the announcement on the bank of the Jordan River. The Messiah has come. Behold the Lamb of God. That takes away the sin of the world. There is probably no better teaching. I'm not saying I did it justice tonight, but I'm telling you, there's no better Bible study than than this right here. It helps us bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament and understand what our salvation costs and what it's in. And it refutes things like works. And it refutes things like you can lose your salvation. It, it, it holds us because it all comes down to, have I put my faith in the blood of a lamb? If, if you had been there the first Passover, would you have sacrificed a lamb? It's a good question, isn't it? A bunch of them, yeah. 37,000, right, Gary? I'm with you. And Stan brings up a great point. Back to the 10 plagues. Had God started with this one, would they have? Maybe not. But isn't God good that he sinned all those plagues and how hard that was because when it came to this one, they all ran and found the spotless lamb and they brought it home. Um, And the Bible says, 
Romans 3.25, will end this. God presented him, Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. God has provided the lamb who takes away the sin of the world, and everyone who trusts in his blood will be saved. That's the message of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word tonight, for your work, your work, not ours, your work, through the blood of Jesus Christ. You conquered sin and death and every power and principality of darkness. In one swift blow, one drop of blood, paid for the sin of the world. Your death And God, I'm so thankful that death couldn't hold the perfect Son of God. You not only conquered sin, but you conquered death once and for all. And God, you invite us to put our faith, not by sprinkling blood on a doorpost, but by putting our faith in the blood of Jesus, applying the blood to our lives in faith, that death will pass over us, that we get to approach God with confidence and boldness and come before you in faith that our sin has been covered, paid for once and for all at the cross of Jesus. Father, we celebrate that in our own lives. As the Egyptians did running out into the promised land, we celebrate that. But Father, we also realize there's a world outside of these doors that are dying in sin and cursed under your judgment that are waiting to hear about the Passover lamb. So, Father, give us the boldness and the voices and the opportunity to go out of these doors and share the love of Jesus with people that we meet. Help us to be your church, especially during this time of season this year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.